Thank you for such a lovely introduction and a warm welcome. I feel very much among friends and um, for those of you I don't know, hello, it's nice to meet you. Um, thank you to the for inviting me to be part of the Children's Literature Series. Thank you to uh, Professor Keller for the introduction as well. And um, I'm really thrilled to be um, part of this series and um, to, um, yeah, to make a contribution. Um, as Justina has explained, my background is in sociolinguistics and I'm going to be talking about um, multilingual picture books from Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I'm going to start with a small greeting in Māori. Um, e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā hau e whā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. I just, that, that was a, a, a a, a greeting that that said, um, re I respect all of your all of the knowledge that everybody brings here, all of the languages every bring everybody brings here from the four corners of the earth. And um, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> I'm just going to shuffle a few papers, get get it so I can see my slides. Thank you. So in this talk, I want to share some of my work exploring the use of more than one language in picture books and what dual language picture books tell us about existing language hierarchies in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I will call it Aotearoa through the, the um, lecture, so you'll know that I'm referring to New Zealand, and the potential for uh, dual and multilingual picture books for disrupting language hierarchies and supporting the revitalization of Te Reo Māori, the Indigenous language of New Zealand and New Zealand Sign Language in this lecture. So. Okay. so underpinning my, a lot of my work really is this idea that children's books are cultural artefacts that reflect the values and ideologies of the society in which they're produced. It's been articulated by many people, but this is from my Australian colleague, John Stevens. <clears throat> and as cultural artefacts, picture books, I believe, pro uh, provide an indirect reflection of the values and ideologies that we deem appropriate to pass on to our tamariki or our children. In my case, I'm interested to know what the multilingual picture books in Aotearoa, New Zealand, tell us about changing attitudes towards the official languages of our country. Before I talk about this, I want to give a little background to multilingual picture books and the official languages in Aotearoa. So firstly, multilingual picture books, <clears throat> of course, they're not new. <laughs> picture books featuring more than one language are not new. Orbis Pictus, for, uh, for example, was by, made by the Czech teacher John Amos Comenius, was published in 1658 in Latin and German. And then in six, nine, 1666, it was published as a quadrilingual edition featuring Latin, French, German, and Italians. And Italian, the range of languages and multilingual picture books can tell us much more than the story of the text. They also tell us about which languages have status and currency for a particular readership or a particular imagined readership. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, there are three official languages um, and they've been given their official status in a range of, in, in different ways. In fact, English has never been given um, legal official status, but it is a de facto official language used by over 90% of the population. After a great period of endangerment and then activism, Te Reo Māori, the language of the indigenous people of New Zealand, was given official status in law in the Māori Language Act of 1987 which means <clears throat> it can be used in, in parliament and other official settings. And um, there is a whole school system in the medium of Te Reo Māori from kindergarten through to university. Um, similarly, in 2006, an act of parliament gave New Zealand sign language official status 
in accordance with, um, because the New Zealand government was signing the United Nation Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2007, and the um, New Zealand Sign Language Act preceded that. I want to give you a little bit of history about these um, three languages. Um, So, um, Te Reo Māori, I'm just going to have to wait a minute while I find the right sheet of paper here. It's, it's gone missing. Here it is. Here it is. Okay. European settlers began arriving in Aotearoa in the early 19th century. And at this time, Te Reo Māori was the dominant language spoken in this country. By the mid 20th century, there were concerns that the language was being threatened. Māori language is an Eastern Polynesian language, which, which um, is unique to Aotearoa, and it has several dialects which are mutually intelligible. When settlers first arrived, many learned to speak te reo in order to be able to live in this new land. Um, the Māori language did not have a written system, it was an oral language, and missionaries, religious missionaries, began to write it down in 1814. Professor Samuel Lee of Cambridge University worked with an eminent Ngāpuhi chief, Hongi Hika, to develop a systematic writing system, and this system was enthusiastically taken up by Māori. Indeed, many uh, more Māori than, than Europeans were literate at, at, an, at the early stage of, of the um, settlement of the country. In the 1850s, European settlers became the majority of the population, and so did the language. So now speaking was discouraged in schools and many parents encouraged, were told they should encourage their children to speak English. During the Second World War, Māori worked in the city and Māori ceased to be the language used at, at home in many cases. But from the, the 1970s, there was a movement for Māori to assert um, uh, their identity and focus on ensuring the language was not lost. Several groups formed and and supported a petition to Parliament to promote the language leading to the establishment of Māori Language Day in 1973, which became Māori Language Week in 1975. In 1978, the country's first bilingual school was established, and in 1981, Te Wānanga Orokawa was established, which is a tertiary institution. And in 1982, the um, um, early childhoods um, schools were established um, using te reo Māori um, and then secondary, the primary and secondary schools were established after that. In 1985 a claim was put before the Waitangi Tribunal um, which led to te reo Māori becoming an official language in 1987. Currently three quarters of Māori adults use some te reo Māori in their daily life. New Zealand Sign Language um, was, has emerged from being um, less visible since the mid-1980s with, with a lot of research, teaching and advocacy leading to its recognition, its current recognition. The New Zealand Sign Language Act of 2006 made it the second offi uh, legal official language parallel with Te Reo Māori. The, as I mentioned before, the New Zealand government ratified the UN Convention for the Rights on the, of the Person with of Persons with Disabilities in 2007, which calls for state parties to facilitate the learning of sign language to promote the linguistic identity of the deaf community and to ensure that deaf children have access to sign language. New Zealand sign language has become more visible in the linguistic landscape of New Zealand, for example, through interpreters working in public domains. And importantly, it's gained legitimacy as part of the deaf children's language repertoires and as a medium, potential medium of education in recent times. And here, certainly the wider New Zealand population has become much more aware of, of New Zealand Sign Language since all the COVID announcements made by our Prime Minister here have, have been fully signed and, and we have seen and learned learn to know many of the official um, interpreters for the government as, as we've watched many, many COVID announcements. 
English in New Zealand arrived with British settlers and settlers from other parts of the world. <clears throat> and by 1850s, it was spoken by the majority of the population. There's been a great deal of work done on the Great New Zealand Vowel Shift, <clears throat> the Great New Zealand Vowel Shift, which um, was based on historical recordings from the New Zealand Broadcasting Unit held, held at, the Can at Canterbury University, which shows the systematic shift which has occurred in New Zealand vowels, similar to the Great British Vowel Shift, which some of you may have may know of, which was a time when there was a really systematic movement of every vowel in a certain way. And it led to things like meat, the word meat, M-E-A-T, used to be pronounced mate, and then it became pronounced meat. Those are the kinds of shifts. So there's a similar shift that happened in New Zealand English. And um, many researchers have also examined the contribution of Maori words to the distinctive geographical dialect, which is New Zealand English and which you are listening to at the moment, um, including many studies of how Maori words know, um, are known and used by English speakers and how, that, how many are used in newspaper articles and Hansard records of parliamentary debate and New Zealand educational um, publications. So just giving you a sense of the three official languages of New Zealand. Um, and now I want to move to talking about some previous studies of multilingual picture books in Aotearoa. Um, there, I began working in this area with a study of uh, the use of Māori loan words in English text of New Zealand picture books. In, in about 2007 um, was my, my first publication in this area. And um, I looked at it, I, I did it because I noticed that um, when I was reading books to my daughter, actually, there were a lot of Māori words used in the English text and the linguistic term for that is when, when one word is used from another language in, inside another language, it's called a loan word um, and sometimes it's called a borrowed word. Um, and um, I noticed that there were lots of Māori words being used in the text and um, when I took a, a, um, a corpus of 13 picture books published by a particular New Zealand publisher called Huya, between 1995 and 2005, when I looked at the frequency of the use of those words, there were 56 per thousand across those 13 picture books. And that was quite um, a stunning finding in a way because in all the other research of how many Māori words were woven into English in other domains, such as Hansard records, um, newspapers, um, educational rather than trade um, children's literature, the highest number of words being used was 12 per thousand, oh, sorry, 25 per thousand. So 56 was a huge jump. And of course, it, it led me to doing lots of thinking about why that might be. Um, and when we thought about it, we the particular publishing house that that we were looking at, Huya, are a publishing house who focus on um, promoting and publishing Māori writers and, um, and, and publishing for um, the population who know some Māori. And so that, of course, would lead to the, the higher use of Māori words in, a, in an English text. So we went on to do a survey of all the picture books published in New Zealand in that same time period. And in the 400 books that were in that corpus, there were only 13 per thousand use, uh, Māori words being used in English. But there were quite a, a substantial set of those books which weren't didn't have any Māori words in them at all. So when we took those out, in the books that did use Māori words, there were 37 per thousand, which is still a very high frequency of, of using words. And we wondered why. I wondered what it... Um, what effect this would be having on the language acquisition of the children listening to these books. It was um, encouraging and developing um, a form of New Zealand English that used more and more of the Māori loan words. And I thought that that was really interesting. And one of the studies that it led me to do um, was to leave the set of 13 picture books with English speaking families of kindergarten age children for a month. I left the books there. I said to the, the parents, please incorporate these into your 
normal reading times. And after a month, I'm going to come back and talk to you about it. You don't have to read them all. You just read which ones you like. And then I'll find out about it afterwards. And when I went and interviewed them, um, I, I really wanted to know, did, did reading these picture books affect the parents' language use? Because I knew if it affected the parents' language use, that would have an effect on the children. And um, several parents, all of the parents said yes, they were using different words they hadn't. There was one parent who was already using lots of Māori words, so she said it just supported her use of Māori words woven into English. Um, but but several of the parents commented on the importance of the Māori words for their identity as New Zealanders. And here's an example of a quote from one of them who said, we're in New Zealand and I think it's important that they, by they they mean she means her children, realise there's another culture here and not just ours and we should actually know a few words. And um, and this was this was interesting to me, this link between the, um, the use of, well, the link between children's literature and national identity was was something that I wanted to think more about. And when I went into the literature, I could see um, people around the world were thinking more about this. Um, Joyce Bainbridge in Canada, for example, and I did go and spend some time with her. Um, it, I, when I went to see Joyce Bainbridge in, in Canada, on the way I stopped in... Um, in London and I went to Roehampton University and it was summertime so many people were away but there was a beautiful display of picture books in the European picture book collection and um, this really inspired me because this was the use this was um, established in about 1996 by Penny Cotton, Dr Penny Cotton um, and at that time, it was the European Picture Book Collection version one, which had about which had twenty picture books, and it, its prime purpose was for children to learn about children in the European Union to learn about other children in other European Union countries through picture books. Um, since then, it's been revised, um, and the logo you see here is the European Picture Book Collection two, um, which has um, more. Uh, representation of European Union countries with a focus on language learning, using the picture books for language learning um, from the various European Union countries. And this really inspired me, this idea of um, picture books being able to represent identity of, of European Union countries. I, I thought, oh gosh, we could do something like that in New Zealand. So when I came home, I developed alongside six of my colleagues, I developed um, the New Zealand picture book collection. We um, This was conceived of as a collection reflecting diversity in New Zealand rather than across a range of countries like the European Union picture book was collection was. It was based on the premise that New Zealand children mostly see picture books from other countries, other English speaking countries such as Britain and the United States. We have a really fabulous range of authors and illustrators of very, very high quality in New Zealand who produce lots of books. But because our market is very small, our population is five, about five million, um, books are often printed once and not reprinted. And, and they make a very small proportion of the books available to children in public libraries or school libraries. So if we use Rudine Sims Bishop's metaphor of books being windows and mirrors, New Zealand children are used to seeing windows into other parts of the Anglophone world and less used to seeing themselves reflected back in mirrors. So the aim of the New Zealand picture book collection was to create a big mirror for children and hopefully making the books really accessible to teachers as well to use them, to bring them into their teaching. Um, so, yes, six of us met for six weekly meetings. We discussed books which should be concluded, included and um, 22 picture books were chosen in the end. When we looked through, um, we kept notes during the selection of the books. It was a fabulous time, such a wonderful discussions. And when I went back and analysed themes from the discussions, these five areas came up. Um, where there was often discussions of family and family types. Um, there were there are a lot of extended family uh, representations in New Zealand children's 
picture books. Um, there were also single family, uh, single parent families, and um, and uh, mother and father parent families. Not many, none at all at this time. And this was in about 2010. None at all featuring same sex parents. Um, the environment featured a lot, and it was a big part of our discussions. The importance of um, seeing new. Zealand scenery and um, and forest and fauna. Tikanga Māori or Māori um, cultural aspects were also came through in many of the books. There was a lot of diversity represented in the books, and not just diversity of ethnicity or gender, but also diversity of perspectives. So. On the slide at the moment, you can see Old Huhu, which is a story of um, two bugs. It's an anthropomorphized story. It's a story of two bugs, and Old Huhu is the larger bug in the image there, and he dies. And Huhu too, the younger bug, um, tries to find out what happens when you die. And there's a diversity of um, understandings of death represented in, in the story. But language, of course, language came up many times, the importance of the New Zealand way of using English, which involves weaving Māori words into it. And um, it got me thinking. Um, it got me thinking about language. Here are two examples of text from two books, one published in 1981 on the left, the, that was pub, uh, the Kuya and the Spider was published in 1981, and one published in 2003 on the right, uh, to, sorry, 2005. So in, in 2001, the Kuya and the Spider, there were six Māori words woven into the English, and there was a glossary given at the end um, to explain to the imagined English reader what those words meant. So here's, um, there's a quote there, the kuya made mats to sit on and mats to sleep on. She made kits for kumara and kits for seafood. So the kuya is an old woman. She made, um, and kits as are woven baskets and kumara is sweet potato. And then in 2005, Haide farewell, Jack farewell. We have the quote, it was night when the first manuhiri came. They cried, talked and sang to Koro Jack. I saw whānau I hadn't seen for ages, even my sister who was hapū. We went to the kai and ate heaps. So when you read that, um, there are about four, five there. Um, five words and three sentences. And when you have, the, have been in the middle of the story and with the pictures there, you can guess what some of the words mean even if you don't know them and there's no glossary provided. So this is, there's a different imagined um, reader in, the, in, in this later book. Um, so both written 24 years apart, both had Māori versions simultaneously produced. And I started to realise that bilingual picture books could be bilingual in a range of ways. And I, as, as some of you have already heard me say in, in previous um, presentations, I tend to talk about three me and my colleagues tend to talk about three different kinds of, of bilingual book, although there's a continuum that's going on. It's not as easy as very separate things. Um, there are translingual, I've, I've also called them interlingual books, stories which are told in one language with borrowed words from the other, like the example from um, Heide that I showed you before. Um, there are stories where the story is told fully in two or more languages. So this one, Kate Pehe Koe, how do you feel? On every page it has Māori and then English. Kate Wera O, I feel hot. And a third kind is the multiversion or the simult which can be simultaneous or asynchronous, where you have two versions of the same book produced at the same time, either at the same time or at different times. This example on the cover here, which was the book of the year in New Zealand in 2018, I think, um, is an example of one where the uh, books was published, um, that they were published at the same time synchronously. So with these three different kinds of picture books in mind, um, I started looking at New Zealand picture books and 
I presented in the 2016 New Zealand Language and Society Conference at the University of Canterbury about looking at the way language was presented on the pages of these books, particularly in the bilingual books. There was something going on in the bilingual books where both languages are present. And when I um, described what, how I was analysing it, my colleague, Professor Janet Holmes, who's a sociolinguist in New Zealand, said to me, gosh, that sounds like linguistic landscapes, Nicola. And she was right. <laughs> so I started to call this the linguistic landscape for picture books approach, if you like. So it's based on an approach um, started by uh, Canadians Landry and Boris um, in 1997, who looked, who said, you know, it's all very well, sociolinguists often look at the way at language policy and, 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 and so on. And um, it's all very, they said it's all very well looking at the policy, but let's look at what's actually here around us. And I mean, I invite you right now to look around you and think about what languages are present around you and what that tells you about the different status of language in reality. Because it's one thing having a policy and saying this language will be this and this language will be that, but actually what language surrounds us in our environment Mostly this talks about the printed environment, although I think more recently people are expanding it to include oral environment as well. But I use this linguistic landscape for picture books to look at the order of languages in the books, to look at the relative size of languages, to look at the comparative font, whether languages are given bold font or italic fonts, and what that might be suggesting to the readers. And you can see in the um, image there, there's an example where we've got Māori first, English second. Māori is bigger and bolder. So Māori is given three forms of um, status, if you like. It's first, it's bigger, and it's bolder. And I wonder when children are seeing languages on the page like that, or any readers, not just children, the parents reading them too, what that's doing and saying to people's uh, uh, language attitudes. So in the rest of the presentation today, I'm going to be presenting from an article I'm currently working on from a presentation I gave at the European Picture Book Network conference last year at Tel Aviv University, exploring how the use of languages and bilingual picture books reflect changing language attitudes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Here's one of the earliest bilingual picture books I could find in New Zealand. It tells of a grandmother diving for crayfish with her grandchild, Crayfishing with Grandmother, it's called, um, written by Jill Bagnell, illustrated by Barbara Strathdee, and translated by Happy Portai. In this book, the Māori text is given after the English text on each page. There's no Māori title on the cover or, or the title page. So the only way you know that there might be some Māori in this book is that the um, translator is given. Happy Portai, Māori text is given um, on the cover and the uh, title page. There's a glossary of Māori words in the English text at the end of the book, like there was for the kuya and the spider, kete, pupu and kina. And... Um, Again, so you can see that the imagined speaker, reader of this book is an English dominant reader. The, the glossary is given for them. English is given first. Um, Māori um, has, has a macron, um, and you can see it on the A in Māori throughout this presentation. Um, and it's interesting to see when Māori words are borrowed into English or woven into English text, do the macrons stay on the, on the Māori words? And generally what happens when words are borrowed from one language into another, they lose those kind of things. And in this um, instance, in the English text, there are some Māori words um, woven in and there are no macrons on those words. And that's something that changes across time. Um, this is definitely aimed at English speakers, as I mentioned, um, but it's making a clear statement about the value and potential place of te reo Māori in New Zealand society. In 1973, Māori hasn't been given official status yet, but 1973 was a time when there was a lot of activism to revitalise te reo Māori. And so um, there's a sense in which I see this book as being a statement about, about um, by two Pākehā writers and creators saying Māori belongs on the page and... Um, and it's here for people to see 
it has a very symbolic status, I think, in this book. 15 years later, in 1988, this bilingual picture book, um, The Legend of the Seven Whales of Ngai Tahu Matawhaiti, Te Paki Waitara o Ngā Tahora Tokufetu a Ngā Taihu, Tahu Matawhaiti by Mary Fanga Sholem and Epania Fanga. This was published uh, by this, this time this is published by a small press established by the author. And this story is a traditional one relating to the tribe the author belongs to. Note that now we're one year after Te Reo Māori has become an official language of Aotearoa New Zealand. And now both English and Māori are on the cover. In, now we have a Māori author telling a story of uh, local significance Māori is on the front page, um, but English is larger on the page. And in the body, Māori text is given on the left, English on the right, which for me, I say that, you know, we read from left to right with, an, with a Latin um, alphabet. And so if Māori is on the left, Māori will be read first if, 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 if you have a reader who can read both languages. So... I think that by being on the left, Māori is given some status that um, noting again that the macrons that on the long vowels um, in the Māori orthography are not on the words in the English text. And this again is a practice that's changed since as Māori has gained in status, the Māori words that are used in English have retained their macrons. And you can, you can see that they're not retained um, on the cover there of in the English title, which says of Ngai Tahu Matawhaiti, there's, there's, uh, there are no macrons. Moving forward another 14 years, we now have a self-published book created by a former early childhood educator to support English medium teachers in bringing Te Reo Māori into the classroom, um, which is a directive from the Ministry of Education where um, teachers are being encouraged to bring more and more Māori language into English medium classrooms. Um, in, this, in this picture book, and this is part of a very big series, we have Māori only throughout the book, but an English translation either at the end of the book or right at the start of the book, just on a single page. There's an audio recording of a song which uses the words in the book as lyrics, um, in English and Māori included, and there's a pronunciation guide given for uh, English speakers. So there's a very definite pedagogical intent here for English speakers to be learning Māori, but Māori has given the most space. And you note that the, on the um, title on the cover there is only given in Māori. Moving ahead another 13 years, we see a, a series of board books being published, again, self-published by two um, cousins, Kitty Brown and Kirsten Parkinson, who have Māori heritage and who want res wanted resources to bring Te Reo Māori into their homes with their young children. And here we have a different approach to supporting English speakers. In the previous slide, the English translation was given on one page at the end or the front of the book, whereas and Māori was right throughout the book. Here, Māori is given status in three ways. It's given first, it's given, it's in bold, and it's bigger than the English text. And the English text is given smaller beneath the Māori text. Again, though, there is a pronunciation guide given for English speakers. So this, you can see the imagined audience of this uh, book is, is an English speaker learning te reo Māori, maybe still needing help with some pronunciation. Only three years later, but 12 years after New Zealand Sign Language was given official status in Aotearoa, we have another set of board books featuring New Zealand's three official languages, English, Māori and Sign Language. In this linguistic landscape, um, English is given first. As you can see, I've got a, a, an example of an in, inner page there. Māori is given second in the same size, but a different colour. Um, and the image of a sign is given to the right of, of the text. So you could say that if we're reading from right to left, um, the sign language is given more status because it's a bigger, but it's perhaps being placed second to the text. 
However, I know that when I look at the books, and I'm still looking for um, literature to support this, when I look at a book, I go to the sign before I go to the text. So that uh, that's something that I have have um, to do some more research about. Um, and in 2019, 13 years after New Zealand Sign Language is made an official language, we have a bilingual, bimodal, dynamic form of a well-known New Zealand picture book, The Little Yellow Digger by Betty and Alan Gilderdale. This audiovisual picture book features the text in English and illustration with a signer in front of each page being given prominence in the linguistic landscape by virtue of his size and the bright colour of his T-shirt. So we see with a delay after New Zealand Sign Language is given official status in 2006, about 10 or more years later, we start to see New Zealand Sign Language coming into New Zealand children's picture books. My last multilingual picture book published in 2020 is written by a fluent speaker of Te Reo Māori with Māori heritage. It was written in Māori as a poem after the author visited a much loved teacher in hospital. And the text asks the reader to listen to and respect your ancestors. So you can see that in the title, Whakarongo ki o tupuna, listen to your ancestors, which is a very strong value in Te Ao Māori or the Māori world. In this book, we have Māori first and larger on the cover. First, and it's given first throughout the puka puka of the book, including in the end papers giving more information about the different gods mentioned in the text. A change has occurred in expectations regarding macrons on the long vowels in Māori words woven into the English text. So now any Māori words in the English text retain the macron on the long vowels. So while in some contexts a word borrowed into a language loses its orthographic practices, now in New Zealand we keep the macron on words woven into English, um, into written English, as a mark of respect for the indigenous language of Aotearoa. Nonetheless, in this in this book, um, the um, the book was written in Maori, and um, the uh, the publisher. Uh, agreed to, to publish it but wanted to include English because this is a small press and having Māori and English would of course increase uh, the people who, who might purchase the book. Um, and the author agreed um, and has received a whole lot of positive feedback from grandparents who may not be as fluent as their grandchildren in Te Reo Māori because it's a language being revitalised. There's a there's a, a generation of people who who um, who who have um, less access to Te Reo Māori than their grandchildren coming through the new Māori medium schooling system who have very fluent Māori language, and having the two languages there has allowed some grandparents to share this book with their grandchildren who wouldn't have been able to share it. Uh, um, otherwise because of their language proficiency. Um, across the seven multilingual picture books I've shared, we can see that these picture books are reflecting and changing attitudes towards, um, reflecting attitudes towards and, ch and reflecting the le changing legal status of the three official languages of New Zealand. We can see that English is retaining its dominance whether by being included in books originally conceived of in another language or by the inclusion of glossaries and pronunciation guides and recorded songs. These picture books reflect the changing status of the three official languages in Aotearoa. They, they reflect the changing relative status of languages in Aotearoa. So the and they also change, reflect some changing expectations of who the audience is and um, what support they might need in order to um, read a bilingual book. Why does it even matter? <laughs> Dual or multilingual picture books matter because they have, picture books in general, regardless of whether they have multiple languages in them, have a very strong place in language acquisition work with my colleagues at the University of Arizona as part of my um, 
Fulbright Fellowship in 2019, 2020, showed how dual language picture books can support children to have, even children, well, it can support children to have working theories about language, to develop, to start thinking about what language is and um, why it exists and how we use it and how we learn it. It can also be used to develop critical language awareness amongst pre-service teachers. Um, we have some research um, we are working on at the moment <clears throat> that shows how these books are very powerful with pre-service teachers um, to um, develop a critical language awareness, an awareness that all languages don't have the same status and, um, and how we can um, use picture books to support languages and linguistic diversity in the classroom. They can also be used, and this is an article that's just been published, to support parents maintaining Indigenous languages in their homes. So um, a colleague of mine and I worked with parents of, of kindergarten children using bilingual picture books, and it was just a pilot study, but it showed some very encouraging signs of the ways that the parents um, used, could use the books in the home to support the use of te reo Māori in their homes um, in conjunction with um, a language program that was going on in the um, in the kindergarten. So to conclude, um, picture books do reflect the status of languages in different communities. Um, picture books can also support changes in attitudes, support language learning, support working theories about language, support critical language awareness, and support indigenous and community language maintenance. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. There's some references there, which I can share with you. If you wanted to email me, I can share those to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, for this uh, insights into very interesting, um, I think, dynamics landscape, the linguistic landscapes. Uh, and I think uh, in Poland we are, uh, because of the, of course, the, the, the situation right now and, and uh, um, the, the war, Russian aggression against Ukraine and the migration, the, ref, the, the growing number of refugee, refugees, I think we are, as Polish people, kind of immersed in the Ukrainian language more and more, uh, wherever we go, uh, whatever we see online with information coming in the or links coming in the Ukrainian as well in Ukraine in the Ukrainian language as well and I'm wondering if we are ever going to have at schools right those uh, programs focused on 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 the two languages Polish and, and, and Ukrainian and like something official because I know that teachers are trying of course to bring together Polish and Ukrainian children um, and and just show or, or encourage this kind of linguistic, exchanges, let's say, but I'm wondering if we are ever going to have policies concerning this. That would be mm. very interesting. To, to it see. takes a long time for policies to emerge I guess in my so. experience. Yeah. And I know that yeah. many, many Māori people and Māori communities did so much work to, to, um, to, re to revitalise their language. I know for many, and you can still find these books in secondhand bookshops sometimes, you find books like this which have um, little pieces of paper stuck over with the Māori translation because for many years there weren't Māori books available. Yeah. There's time for questions, uh, please. Uh, just to remind you, you can ask the questions directly and, and uh, um, uh, but also if you have access to, to the chat. Uh, I can see Makarena. Yes, Makarena. Yes, thank you. Please. So yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. I thought that it would be great that Chileans listen to this actually. We are going through this process of recognizing uh, our First Nations, or we still do not have actually the name yet, but we are in the process of writing a new constitution and for the first time it, Chile will be a plurinational country. So this comes like really interesting reference in this context and I wonder if you could say something about whether there's also, like, how does it change how the Maori people, if I can say it like that, are represented through the years? Um, 
because I have the, the so as far as I know of picture books, for instance, published here, and I think that it's the same in other, in other Latin American countries, we get a lot of like these kind of um, folkloric depictions. And just very recently, more complex um, social dynamics or cultural dynamics, if you want. Mm. Uh, so there's also something like that going on and how that yes. might or might not be connected to the linguistic, I would say that. Yes. And then, and, and then if I also may add another question, I think that it's also quite interesting, like all those words that you said at the beginning that are borrowed, uh, I guess that those are words that you use, like in your, if I understood correctly, when you speak English, you, of course you use a lot of Maori words, um, and those are English words in a way, or, or you do not make a difference, mm. right? So whether in order for you to code those words, like where, how can you code those words as Maori, because we have the same, for instance, we have a lot of words that are Spanish, but then we know that come, for instance, from the Mapuche people. Mm. But we do not call them necessarily. Yeah. As, you know, so yeah. I do understand what you mean. I think, um, you know, exchange between languages is a very natural thing. Whenever people come in contact, they exchange words and if, and in any language, but I look at English because it's the language I know the best. There are many words from all over the world involved in my language and I'm not necessarily aware of them when I'm using what I call English. But I think in, in New Zealand, we're very aware of which words are Maori because alongside us, we have a language being revitalized and gaining more and more, um, more and more um, strength. And, and so um, I hear Māori language being spoken a lot um, and, on, and there is, as I mentioned about the long, the macron on the long vowels, in spoken New Zealand English, there we also try and um, keep the pronunciation of Māori true to the Māori language, whereas in a lot of um, situations where a word comes is woven into another language, it takes on the pronunciation of the, the language it's being borrowed into. But in New Zealand, um, for many people, not all, but for many people, there's um, an, uh, we try to retain the pronunciation. So we, I think it's because the language is existing alongside us and being revitalised and strengthened and th that we are very aware of the Māori words. And, of course, people with Māori um, heritage of a very aware of which Māori words, which words in English are Māori as well. I think that's what makes us aware of the words and their identity. Going back to the question about representations, Makarena, um, in the New Zealand picture book collection, the, yes, we did have um, one that was um, uh, legends and folklore, um, but <clears throat> many of the books represent contemporary Māori society, um, contemporary Māori families. So um, I, that hasn't always been the case, um, but certainly in the in those books but being published by Huia Publishers, which has a big effect on the picture book landscape of New Zealand, um, they are representing stories of contemporary Māori society. And so, that yes, there are folkloric, and in fact, we're getting a few books coming through of contemporary retellings of traditional folklore coming through now, but, but there are also many books that feature Māori characters in contemporary society. Well, thank you very much for the question. Yes, and for Do we have any, any more questions, comments? Hmm? I'm looking at the chat. Uh, oh, Sarah. Uh, uh, Sarah is not on the general chat, but let me just check. Um, she has shared her question in another way in the private chat, uh, but I, I'm not sure I can access. Oh, yes. Just give me a second, please. Um, it's loading. Okay, uh, so it's a question from Sarah Pini, uh, who says she's sorry she cannot access the general chat, uh, but um, 
Yes, uh, she she thank you very she she says thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. I would like to ask you about the loan words in picture books in English. What kind of words, nouns, verbs are usually borrowed from Tereo Maori? Mm. Maori. Mm. Do they belong to specific cultural areas such as religion, food, etc.? Mm, thank you for that question, Sarah. That's a great question. Um, people have done work on looking at which words are borrowed. And of course, um, a lot of words are borrowed um, to do with uh, trees and birds and um, insects. New Zealand doesn't have any native mammals except for two bats. <laughs> so, the, but, so there's no mammal names that have, were borrowed. But um, um, the... Yeah, that mostly at the start they were to do with things like trees and 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 birds. Um, what's happening as time goes by is that we are borrowing more and more. They are mostly nouns, and we are borrowing more and more words that um, relate to um, just general life. So, for example, um, we use the word fana for family. We use um, we starting to use some verbs like um, <clears throat> we might say e tu for stand up to give a in a, in a classroom situation e noho for sit down um, uh, we use hui for um, meeting and funnily enough during the pandemic when we were doing lots of Zoom meetings we there was a um, a blend coined which was zui so a hui on Zoom became a zui. Um, uh, so yes, mostly nouns, mostly at the start of a start of the kind of contact between the two cultures, it was a lot of forest and flora and fauna. Um, and now more and more increasingly, um, nouns relating to social situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, thank you. for the question. And, thank uh, you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, for the answer. And then there's a question in the chat as well uh, uh, from uh, Karen. Um, let me have a look. Uh, just give me a second. When looking at uh, interlingual, translingual picture books with loan words, does any of your analysis look uh, at the borrowed words? Uh, are they non, uh, nouns or are they full sentences, dialogue? Okay, so, yes. Do we have full sentences? That's a very I good haven't question. Done, yes, we do have some uh, full sentences. So in um, in this book, which I, I've mentioned a few times, there's um, a full sentence at one point. Um, in fact, the, the very last sentence of the book is haerera e koro haerera. And in, um, in the linguistics of contact uh, languages, Sometimes people say that if you go from a single word to a whole sentence, then that's code switching. But of course, our understanding of code switching is, is developing and, and more and more now we talk about translanguaging and, and the idea of people accessing their whole linguistic repertoire um, rather than the idea of keeping languages separate and you, you, you shift between them, although that still is spoken about. Um, so yes, um, Carrie Ann, I haven't done any um, analysis of the extent to which whole sentences are used or single words, but they are whole sentences are used, and that is an area that I could look more at, which I haven't. Thank you for your question. Uh, there was actually a second part uh, yeah. in the question. If I may just uh, just please. Uh, to add, uh, so the question was, uh, so okay, this use of of sentences or even dialogues. Uh, how might that play into language attitudes? I think you touched on mm. that already, but maybe you'd like yeah. to add something. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, I think I think the interplay between language attitudes and what's in picture books is a very dynamic and two-way relationship. Um, I think I think publishers and writers make judgments about who their audience is and who and to what extent they could use whole sentences or not. And, and it does, um, the way language is used in a, in a picture book is a judgment by the publisher and author about who their, author, who their audience might be, but it also, it also is a way of selecting the person who picks the book up. It, it kind of works in two ways. Um, so I think 
I think um, I think picture books represent attitudes that are going on, but they can also influence and change attitudes. And there's kind of like this ongoing um, tension between the two, between the two, um, as to what. And, and I think ultimately publishers are often making kind of financial judgments in the end. What can we do that people will buy? And that's really contingent on people's language attitudes. Um, and, and that has been changing over time, as I, as I hope I've shown in the, in the presentation. Um, but it, 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 so I might pick this book up and it might actually change my attitude. I might enjoy the story so much that even though I might not be a person who knows a whole lot of Māori and I might not have very positive attitudes towards Māori, the fact that the last sentence is in completely in Māori, I might have enjoyed the whole book so much that I'm happy to go with that. And that's having an effect on my language attitude right there at that moment. But then on the other hand, I might be a person who who that might not be enough Māori for, but there's, there's a kind of a a trade-off and, and a tension going the whole time about what, 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 to what extent I can weave the two languages together. It's it's very interesting. Thank you for your question, Carrie Ann. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, and thank you for the answer, uh, Nicola. Do we have any more comments, questions? I, I can't see any, if I may, uh, I was wondering, I know it's not your focus, uh, but uh, do you see similar uh, developments uh, in other forms of children's culture in New Zealand? I don't know, cartoons, for example, mm. uh, films. Yes, yes. Some yes. online, um, I don't know. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. We, have a, um, we have a channel on the television um, that's, that's completely in te reo Māori. Um, but, but in terms of, we don't, the, the, the um, cartoons and things will often only be in Māori because they're trying to be there to support the revitalization of the language. Um, but in any films, for example, I don't know if any of you saw Whale Rider, which was a big um, New Zealand film a while back, which, I mean, you could argue whether that's, a, I think it's for adults as well as children, but it was a children's book that was made into a, a, um, a film. And it, it included a lot of Māori language. Uh, there was switching between English and Māori because the story was about a Māori community. Um, so, yes, you do see the same... Um, trends happening and you see it happening in our news broadcasts um, in um, in many aspects of society in advertising <clears throat> Māori words are used in the English advertising I mean there is Māori advertising completely on its own as well but <clears throat> in the English advertising and in English newspapers and in English um, um, television news and radio news and and um, online broadcasts Māori language is woven into the English language and um, in, in the same way. I feel like my, certainly that early study that I mentioned where there was a very high proportion of Māori words being used in the English texts, I, I wonder if um, in texts aimed at children that there is maybe people use um, maybe people who are writing in English use more Māori in, in texts aimed at children, especially picture books because you have illustrations there to support comprehension. But, um, yes, I, I just, I wonder, it feels to me like that this um, these books are kind of the cutting edge of new culture, if you like, and new ideas and new attitudes come through here. That's That's how I, that's my understanding. Hmm. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Oh, there is another question uh, uh, in the uh, in the chat uh, from Heidi. Can you talk a bit about how these books have been or could be used in teacher preparation? Hmm. Thanks for that question, Heidi. Um, well, when um, we we actually had a six week, um, my colleague Kathy um, Short, Professor Kathy Short of the University of Arizona, and I had a six week picture book club with 
pre-service teachers and we introduced um, dual language picture books from around the world to the, to the students each week. And um, just by providing opportunity for the students to look through the books and first of all, acknowledge that they that these kind of books exist and then move forward to looking kind of critically in the way I've already discussed today about the way the languages are presented and which languages are given more space and more, more status, if you like, um, and thinking about who books are for um, and thinking um, and discussing with them. So how might we use these books? How could you use them in your, in your practice? Simply opening uh, exposing the students to the books and having those kind of discussions seemed to um, have a have an effect on on their critical language awareness is what I would call on their awareness that language um, that languages do have different power and different status in society and that um, books can actually do something to support languages which might have less power they can play a role in revitalizing indigenous languages or bringing bringing the linguistic repertoire of your classroom into the classroom, even if you don't know it yourself, you can still bring a book in that has got the language that you know with the language that ch child is bringing into the classroom. It, that, those six, six weeks that we spent, which is just one hour a week, um, seem to um, shift a lot of awareness and create a lot of critical language awareness. Um, so I think they're very, they have a lot of potential for working with pre-service teachers for thinking about their future classroom practice. Um, so there's been work by researchers in Canada bringing um, dual language picture books into kindergarten and primary settings um, and inviting members of the community um, into the classroom to read languages that the teacher might not know or else inviting um, children in the classroom who who may be literate in a home language to stand up and and read with with the teacher read both of the languages so it makes their linguistic well it kind of normalizes multilingualism and um, makes um, the linguistic repertoire of some children which is often completely invisible in a classroom it, it can these books can make it visible and one and one thing we I've spoken about with people is just simply having the books in the classroom even if you do nothing with them in front of the class having the having books in your classroom that that re, that reflect the linguistic repertoire of the children in your classroom means that at times the children can just go and look at those books and kind of know that yeah their linguistic repertoire is visible in the classroom in some small way thanks for your question heidi uh, thank you for the question and for the uh, for the answer. There's one more question in the chat uh, from Kate. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk, Professor Daly. May I know if there are any picture books in your analysis that discuss the indigenous Maori culture as their main themes, uh, thus prioritizing, and the question goes on, uh, thus prioritizing the the real Maori as the main text in the picture books, whereas using English as subtitles that explain the, no, to, the notions of uh, the yes. real Maori. And yes. that's Kate from Taiwan, uh, and she says, Thank you, Kate. Say. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Kate. Um, so I'm thinking of the book. Um, so I showed a book a bit like this a bit earlier in the same series, which does um, prioritize Maori. Um, it doesn't, this, the st stories in this book aren't strongly about Māori culture. This is about feelings. So, kei te pehe koe kōkako, how are you? So, the English is there as a kind of a subtitle. You can see there. Um, this book <laughs> is um, really about a Māori family having, um, somebody's died in the family and they, they, um, there is a funeral and then a new baby is born. So there's a kind of a cycle of life story here. But this is an English text with Māori words in it. So I'm just trying to think. I think you asked, is there a picture book that features a story about a Māori community which prioritises Māori with English underneath? And I can't think of one at the moment. Hmm. Interesting. I probably think of one later, Kate. <laughs> I'll let Justina know. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'll, I'll pass it on then. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for the question thank and for the, for the answer. Do we have any other comments? I'm checking the chat. Okay, if I may have a question, and again, I'm sorry for maybe going into other directions a little bit. No, but, please, um, it's good for me. Yeah, you mentioned <laughs> uh, just again following up on, on these issues of representation. Um, uh, in YA literature, for example, uh, would we have also focus, uh, more and more focus on indigenous uh, characters, their lives, uh, do you think? I miss in YA literature. In YA? Yes. Yes. Now, I was on the New Zealand Book Award judging panel last year, and um, the YA section was won by a, a picture book that was yes, definitely focused on a Māori main character, Māori community. It was a fabulous book. It's um, called Poor Rangi Boy, and I can't write that down for you, but it's, it's really great. Um, and... Um, now it's not it's not YA, but um, the adult big picture the the big adult awards. It's called the Ockham Book Awards. Were announced last night, and the fiction winner was about a, a very by a Maori writer featuring a Maori community. Yeah, so it's um it's very very much um, it, books about by Maori authors uh, about Maori communities are very, um, very uh, visible and, 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 and respected is what I would say. Yeah. And winning awards, they're, they are award winning, very high quality. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm asking also because uh, you mentioned The Whale Rider. I don't know the book, I must say. I haven't read it. Uh, I watched the film. Um, mm. And uh, uh, I, I think it... Uh, Maybe the film somehow f has functioned for a long time as this kind of, you know, representation of Maori communities uh, abroad, right? I mean, mm. you know, the kind of vision that I, I guess dominated our perception, <laughs> or at least for me, well, mm. but that, that's of course my ignorance and, and, and the fact that I haven't explored that further. Uh, but would you say that the, well, the, if, if you look at the representation of, of the Maori community in the film, at least, uh, you can see that there are kind of pretty, I don't know how to put it, isolated. Uh, you know, it's it's a Maori village. Uh, mm. You can see mm. that they live in poverty. Mm. And, uh, there is, uh, uh, so, so I, I was wondering if, if this kind of representation, this, this way of representing their lives, whether that has changed in any way. Uh, yes, or whether I mean, in reality these lives are different yes. somehow. I'm sorry, maybe that's too broad question to naive in a way, I think. Well, but I suppose at the same time. what I would mm -hmm. say is there are re remote communities, but the majority mm -hmm. of, of Māori live urban in urban settings. Yeah. And yeah, so course, the, yeah. the books that I'm talking about now are representing Māori in urban settings. Yes, yeah, yeah. that one had a particular link to mythology with the with yes, the whale course, rider. Yes. Yeah, and um, and the community um, it it may it may look it may look like that community in in the whale rider were living in poverty, but I don't think that that's how they would describe themselves. It's yeah, it's yeah, another but way of living. yeah. That, that's yeah, right. Yes, I know it's right. the way it's, it's right. the way it, you might perceive it, but it's. I I think that there would be other understandings of of um, of of wealth, of wealth. Yes, there. exactly. That's yeah, right. and, and well, the job yes. is yes, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so yes, I would say that um, that that there's more diversity. Definitely, there is, <laughs> there is, the there is, and yeah. and the certainly the majority of of. Māori live in urban settings. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Are there any more comments, questions? 
if I may have just one more and then I will <laughs> Nicole, yeah. I won't <laughs> we'll let you go, but um, and, and and maybe catch up with you <laughs> with some sleep. <laughs> yeah, no, but, no, no, but, I'm uh, going to work. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But uh, I was I was wondering, uh, okay, you mentioned this this work at schools, and I'm wondering uh, if uh, there are any studies of like reader response studies uh, of, of these texts among children going on? No, there aren't any reader response studies that I know of. Mm -hmm. There probably are, and I don't know of them, but I don't know of any reader response studies. Um, I have a, some work going on with a colleague at the University of Waikato who he is a colleague, he is, um, his area is, is design. And, um, oh, sorry. And um, so we're interested, and this isn't reader response, I know, but we're interested in looking at, um, uh, we've looked at a whole lot of, um, with a master student, one of our master students looked at um, adults' responses to books Yep. with with text and which one they which languages they thought were more important and what they thought the design told them about the status of the languages i think it would be very interesting to to come up with a methodology to look at children's responses to these books i really do i think it would be it would be interesting i think creating the methodology would be so interesting because i'm not quite sure how you would do it um to, mm -hmm. to um yes Mm, I, I, um, There's a comment from uh, from uh, Carrie Ann that she wants to do a reader response study of translingual picture books oh, in, in elementary classrooms in the US for her dissertation. Fabulous, Carrie Ann, so again, do it. Thing to connect do it. the two of you. Yes, we want <laughs> you to do the, it. <laughs> yeah, and there is also a, maybe the final question for today uh, from Heidi: What is the future direction of your research, Nicola? Well. I've got a few different things. We've just had, um, we've just had, um, I'm interested in um, working with uh, more uh, pre-service teachers and I'm working, interested in working with teachers as well, both of them using bilingual books to see um, how they can be used in the classroom. And alongside that in my head is the idea that I'd like to get to the point where I'm seeing how the children respond. So. Yeah, exactly. Carrie Ann develops the methodology. I will use it, Carrie Ann, <laughs> and um, that's that's the way I'm going at the moment. I'm in, I'm I'm also interested in looking at um, at the ways that that the language hierarchy in other countries are represented, and um, particularly in relation to the use of picture books to support the revitalization of mm. indigenous languages, but also yeah community languages, um, to make, to maintain community languages. Um, those are the areas I'm interested in. Thanks for the question, Heidi. And thank you, uh, Nicola. Thank you for all, uh, first of all, for the wonderful lecture and for, uh, um, for all these comments, very insightful comments, revealing so much about your work, but also about this broader, uh, uh, broader context of uh, children's literature and culture. Uh, in, mm. in New Zealand. Thank you so much for that. And to the audience, a big thank you for being here uh, and for, uh, for all these questions and comments as well. And of course, we are looking forward to reading your research and, and, and to, to learning about your future uh, yes. projects. And if well, anybody does so want the references, yeah. just let me know. I'm just nicola.daily at Waikato. <laughs> so you should be able to find me quite easily. Of course. Thank yeah. you. Thank you.